Hello, and welcome to More Intelligent Tomorrow. A wide-ranging exploration of the potential impact of AI on the world around us, as envisioned by the future heroes of the human and machine intelligence revolution. What are the future intelligence battles to prepare for? We'll discuss this and more with General David Petraeus on today's episode. And now, your host, Ari Kaplan. General, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Great to be with you, Ari. Thanks for the invitation. Sure. Just wanted to start out thanking you so much for all of your service and appreciate your time coming on here. Both are a privilege. Now, where do you see artificial intelligence and even before that, the foundations of uh, you know, army intelligence uh, and the role in warfare today? Well, I think to put this in context uh, and to ensure that we all appreciate how powerful artificial intelligence is, let's remember that it first uh, wowed everyone by showing that a machine could beat the reigning uh, chess grandmaster. Uh, then it took on a, an even more complex game, uh, the game of Go, which has multiple dimensions, not just uh, uh, two. Um, then it even beat humans uh, at the, among the most complex games that are out there, these civilization building games, if you will, uh, and demonstrated an incredible capability in that regard as well. Uh, in, indeed, DeepMind has been part of a lot of these. Uh, I know the, the founders uh, of that and have enormous respect for them. Um, in, in the past year, we've seen in the realm of uh, warfare, if you will, or at least practice for that, uh, in a simulation, uh, an aircraft that was piloted, if you will, by artificial intelligence, uh, defeated a, an aircraft in a dogfight, uh, an aircraft that was piloted by a human. So artificial intelligence continues to break through more and more and more. Um, so this is well beyond machine learning, just uh, the machine doing repetitive tasks. Uh, and again, learning a bit from it. This is, this is machine that again is just constantly improving uh, its knowledge of what it needs to do to prevail uh, in a certain endeavor uh, that is guided by certain rules. Uh, and again, it doesn't get much more complex than a dogfight. And indeed, artificial intelligence has proven its value even in that very, very complex activity. Yeah, th that, that's great to hear. And um, you know, one reason why you know, we, uh, as, as a country, as humanity, need to make AI as a priority. And I do love how you framed you know, started out with the chess game, and in a way, the, the way you're talking that humans and artificial intelligence collaborate up, and then, you know, for example, recognizing a face or rep recognizing the gate, um, then some people will try to do counter, you know, how can we disguise that? Of and course. Then, and then it just keeps cycling. How can you... Um, well, there will be offense and defense. There will be counter AI strategies. There will... People will cloak themselves. They will uh, have some kind of material that um, will provide a degree of stealth, uh, perhaps. And again, there's going to be a constant back and forth. And the same will be taking place, of course, in cyberspace itself, uh, because, of course, that's where the networks are. Uh, and the battle, again, between machines in cyberspace is going to be incredibly fierce, uh, just as it is now when it comes to the fight between offensive and defensive activities in cyberspace. And we've seen recently, uh, once again, that the offense often is ahead of the defense. And keeping in mind, of course, this is a little bit like cybersecurity being on the defense is a little like conducting a counterinsurgency uh, campaign. The counterinsurgent has to protect everything, um, has to, or at least everything that matters. And that's a vastly greater realm than the offensive system uh, has to focus on, which is to find a penetration point somewhere. 
Uh, and thus, defense in many respects is, is far more difficult uh, than is offense. And keep in mind that offense, as we saw with the SolarWinds hack, with the recent Microsoft mm -hmm. hack, is getting ever more sophisticated. Uh, and, and, and again, of course, it is enabled in part by machine learning, uh, by artificial intelligence, and by just sheer networks that can be put together uh, to carry out whatever diabolically clever scheme uh, is developed. Yeah, we were talking about, you know, as the technology improves and, you know, all these challenges and opportunities emerge, uh, you know, there's ethics that uh, come with it. One of the big topics we see really across all industries, you know, healthcare, finance, retail, um, you know, are how do you trust AI, uh, but also how do you uh, work uh, ethically, and especially, you know, with warfare. So what are your, what are your thoughts on ethics in warfare and with AI's role with that? Let's look at the field of, uh, again, of, of DNA and of, uh, you know, the sequencing of the human genome and the ability now to actually make changes in that. Um, and here in a, in a heartening uh, direction, um, almost all countries, I, the major countries that are seeing the advances in these fields uh, are again being quite cautious and conservative uh, about how these tools should be used. Uh, China agrees with this. Uh, you may recall there was a certain activity in this realm that took place in China. There was a big reaction against it and China, Chinese authorities agreed with that. Again, you're talking, I mean, this is literally becoming, in a sense, if you will, in quotes, the hand of God, uh, mm -hmm. that you can alter um, the appearance of, of a person. You can alter, again, the building blocks of that person. Now, that can be very, very good um, if it enables the uh, elimination of some genetic component that dooms every individual who has that to a life that is less than full. Um, but that needs to be very, very carefully thought through before, uh, again, these ethical guidelines are agreed. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, what do you think we can learn from this uh, lost year, uh, you know, due to the, the virus and how can we, you know, be better prepared for the next pandemic and, you know, biodefense? Well, there are numerous lessons in a whole variety of different fields. Uh, I mean, including, for example, that, you know, maybe we don't all need to travel as, as crazily as we used mm -hmm. to. And, you know, the, this frenetic schedule of flying around the world, you know, I do 25 countries in a year, one of them six to eight times alone all the major cities in the United States. I mean, is that really necessary in a world of Zoom? Um, no, it's not actually. Uh, and we've learned a lot about how to be vastly more efficient uh, with our time. And, and again, the new normal as a result is not going to be just a resumption of the old normal. There are going to be changes that endure. And among those changes, very likely will be that not everyone is going to go to offices, as used to be the case. In fact, in some uh, different companies, depending on what they do, uh, we already see some really big tech companies that are saying they're, they're never going to require uh, their employees to come back to the office. So there will be a degree of individual choice and in what are the personal circumstances and so forth. So that's a whole realm you know, that, uh, of how we work. Um, there's going to be uh, lessons learned about how we play, um, how we um, travel, how we, all of these, there's going to be uh, a series of uh, lessons taken from this that we will see in, in behavior going yeah. forward. But when it comes to the issue of how can we uh, do better uh, the next time there is something that emerges like this virus that led to this pandemic, uh, clearly there are lots of, uh, of actions that can and must be taken, uh, whether it is much better surveillance uh, so that it's identified very early on. Uh, international organizations play a role in this, as do our own 
uh, national uh, departments and, and agencies and centers. Uh, the distribution of information, uh, the big ideas at which we ultimately arrived uh, that were put out by the Centers for Disease Control and the National Governors Association, uh, but which frankly were undermined uh, in some cases at the federal and state level uh, and weren't followed and, and so forth and so on. Uh, the very big ideas literally about how do you aggregate the requirements for procurement, uh, for validation of needs, uh, and for distribution uh, of those. Uh, all of these, there's tons of lessons that I think we have learned, or in some cases, frankly, relearned. Uh, and also, of course, what should be in the national stockpile when it comes to personal protective equipment, uh, to a variety of different uh, drugs and, and so forth. So again, I, there will be lots and lots of uh, lessons learned, uh, sessions um, of inquiries into what we did, what we didn't do, what we should have done, and most importantly, what we need to do next time. And again, I think there will be uh, a lot of corrective measures taken and a lot of lessons learned from this. Uh, that absolutely should enable us to do a far better job next time because there will be a next time. There has been uh, experience of this in the past, multiple experiences, uh, SARS and so forth. And in some cases, we did much better. In some cases, the context and the uh, circumstances were very different. But clearly, we have to learn from an experience that, again, has killed over a half million of our fellow citizens. Uh, you were talking about uh, getting that competitive advantage almost so much that um, you know, it's really un unstoppable. Uh, what um, do you view the, the role of the Space Force um, you know, and, and also you know, the future of colonizing beyond Earth? Well, I, I do believe that the Space Force uh, as an institution uh, was called for. I, I agree with the decision and how it is go being structured at present in the organizational architecture and so forth underneath the Department of the Air Force still, which will economize on some of the aspects of the institutional uh, elements that need to be established in the short run at the very least. Uh, but clearly space is a very, very rapidly advancing frontier. Um, you see the advent of personal companies, uh, whether it's SpaceX or uh, Virgin Galactic, I think it is, or Blue Origin. I mean, again, these this is um, showing to be vastly more agile, uh, much cheaper. Uh, I mean, the idea of reusable uh rockets and boosters and all the rest of that is just transformative in and of itself. Uh, and so within a number of years, you're going to, um, you know, be able to book yourself on the ultimate e-ticket. If you remember the, the, the greatest rides at Disney land, uh, the most extreme, if you will, were those that required an e-ticket. Uh, and this is going to be the, the most ultimate e-ticket ever envisioned. Uh, you can go into space and experience weightlessness for yourself. But beyond that, of course, there are many, many scientific and research advances uh, that are possible in a world of, again, of zero gravity or different gravity. Uh, the exploration that this allows is going to be extraordinary. You mentioned uh, the role of, again, artificial intelligence powered machines on Mars uh, that will carry out a variety of activities uh, in the weeks and months that lie ahead. Uh, so again, this is, it, it's long been identified as the new frontier, the, and it, it still is to some degree, uh, but you're now seeing advances uh, accelerating uh, that are once again going to transform what goes on in space in a whole variety of different ways. And the Space Force, I think, is an appropriate answer to that within the U.S. military structure and in the Department of Defense. Uh, but you're seeing extraordinary advances in the private sector as well. Great. And you know, with grandkids, new generations on the way, what do you want your legacy to look like? 
Um, you know, if you draw back a bit, I guess, and, you know, reflect on what I sought to do in, in uniform and the intelligence community, and perhaps even in, in the business world, I guess it is to uh, encourage uh, never-ending learning, uh, to be a learning organization yourself, and to help ensure that the organizations uh, which are privileged to be a part are striving to learn and uh, to be inquisitive and to uh, explore uh, and all the rest of that. And uh, that idea of uh, education and particularly for those of us in the military and in government service where you tend to work very long hours, it's almost culturally, uh, it's almost genetic actually that you know you're really, you're, your nose is definitely to the grindstone and you never leave before the boss does and you're in before the boss comes in and and you also have a slightly cloistered existence because, again, you're living on a base, perhaps you're mingling socially with the same people that uh, you tend to work with in those endeavors. And so out of your intellectual comfort zone experiences are of the greatest value, at least in my personal and professional development. For me, that was going to a civilian graduate school. Um, and it was a transformative uh, experience. Um, you know, not only do you learn better critical thinking skills and analytical skills and, you know, certain fundamental uh, capabilities and certain knowledge in certain sectors, um, you also learn, I think, or you should, a degree of intellectual humility that there are seriously bright people out in the world who don't see it the same way that we do. And I had very much lived the grindstone cloister syndrome prior to going to graduate school. Uh, and so it was this extraordinary two-year experience for me. And in many respects, you know, when people ask me, what, how did you know what to do when you were first in Iraq and as a young two-star general division commander of the great 101st Airborne Division, and you seemed to know what needed to be done? And... I said, gosh, it may have been graduate school at Princeton that uh, enabled me best of all. Certainly, it was the experiences that I had in Central America briefly or Haiti with the United Nations Force or Bosnia for a year or some of these other deployments, Kuwait and so forth. But at the end of the day, it was really, I think, what was developed during that time uh, in that most out of my intellectual comfort zone experience of my life. And so as a result, when talking to people about how do you uh, strive to be someone who is constantly learning, exploring, uh, inquiring, uh, I think having those kinds of experiences is absolutely uh, essential. Uh, and then I think just conveying the idea that luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity and what individuals should do is try to prepare for those opportunities. They may ne never come along. I mean, there was only one surge in Iraq during my military career. Uh, it just so happened that I was in a position uh, to be selected by the president to command that surge. And in many respects, when you look back, you know, I spent my entire life preparing for that particular task at that particular moment. Um, it may never have come, but the key is that it, if it did come, that you be prepared for it and that you are there for perhaps, quote, lucky uh, as a result. And there is luck, there is timing, but there's also preparation. Uh, and again, all of us should just strive to be as prepared as we possibly can for what will present itself uh, in our lives, not just professionally, but personally as well. Well, great. Well, General, thank you for those words of wisdom, and we greatly appreciate your service and your leadership and your time. So thank you so much. Uh, the privilege is mine, Ari. Thank you.